anything's possible though, because you know Bitcoin is money. So you know, money talk, man. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast, powered by Coin Telegraph. What began as a small experiment is now a rapidly expanding ecosystem. As citizens of the internet, we expect to be able to send money over the internet as quickly and cheaply as sending an email. As citizens of the internet, we demand transparency. Here, we talk about Bitcoin, Ethereum, blockchain industries, fintech, and more. But we're not experts. We're just three guys in the Bitcoin community. And adoption is the only thing that matters. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast, episode number 124. I'm your first host, Marcello. And I'm host number two, D. Host number three, Corey. Corey. Hey, Hey. big ups to us. Big ups to us. 200,000 downloads. Congratulations, us. 200,000 downloads. That's a lot. That's that's two times 100,000 downloads for you guys that suck at math. I thought I'd clear that up, I thought I'd clear that up for you. Yeah, and we're running time, out of milestones here. Uh, what we got plenty of milestones. Cello, yeah. what's so significant about the 200,000 downloads? This, like, what what's the difference between the first 100,000 and the second 100,000? We reached it so much quicker. I yeah. feel like. Our, we're going to reach 300,000 in like half the time it took us to reach 200,000. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the growth then, rate is uh, is pretty nice. You can take a look at our stats online. Go to the BitcoinPodcast.com, click on statistics. We publish that stuff because we're cool like that and no other podcast does. Yeah, we're not shy. Yeah. Not all the time do you get to S your own D, but oh, are we allowed to talk like that still? We did it anyways, we so we, <laughs> we can do exactly what we want, and you know it feels good. Um, we love making the show for you guys that listen to us, and um, keep listening and keep telling everybody you know um, to come listen to the Bitcoin podcast because we're where you go when you want to hear about Bitcoin, Bitcoin news, a little learn a little something something about Bitcoin and blockchain and Ethereum and all these cool fancy things. And and uh, we make it listenable. And now with less dogs and babies. Yep, that's true. Yeah, my kids are growing up. They're less annoying. I have a, <laughs> I have a studio where my dogs don't come up here, and it's isolated from the rest of my my house. Yep, and I'm usually in hotel rooms. So, <laughs> all right, what do you want to talk about today? I want a sponsor. Hit him with a sponsor, Shallow. All right, man. We are brought to you by the most trusted name in Bitcoin ATMs. And they're located all over Texas and Miami and a couple other states. Uh, <laughs> but we're brought to you by Athena Bitcoin. And I'm, I'm only being vague because I want you to go to the App Store and Google Play and download this. And then also I want you to go to their website. And they have a full list of all their locations. They're always adding stuff all the time. And we endorse them fully. And that's AthenaBitcoin.com. And we're also brought to you by their portfolio company, BitQuick.co. Secure, quick, easy, peer-to-peer Bitcoin marketplace where you can get Bitcoin for cash in as little as three hours. So where there's a bank, there's BitQuick. And for those of you that can't see the Skype call we're on, Cello pointed at the at the camera when he said that in a very, like, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm saying this. Yeah, I'm He's saying it. Way more you, official that way. Point directly at you. Because he wants you to go. I believe in our sponsors. I believe in them. Yeah, good I mean, people. They're in the Slack. They talk to us. They, it's not just one of those, you know, here's some money. Talk yeah. us up. They, they, they're part of the community of the Bitcoin podcast. So, You know what? Athena Bitcoin, I want to let you guys know that my mother wears you guys' shirt like every weekend. Like she cleans in it. She cooks in it. <laughs> and I think it'd be cool. If she could be like the Athena Bitcoin spokes mother. So if you think that'd be cool, let me know. And I'll send you like a, a high-res like photo. The chunky soup. She could be like the, the, the chunky soup ambassador. 
Yeah. Like uh, <laughs> De- Donovan McNabb's mom. Yeah. <laughs> my mom. She's like, get some, big, get some Bitcoin. Um, anyways, what's on the docket, man? Uh, well, there's a new record. We are now officially 90 days over $800. So that's stability. That's good. 90 days, huh? That's a new record. That's a quarter. It's a fiscal quarter. Huh. Well, that is pretty good news. Over $800, too, is excellent news. The price is becoming a lot more substantial, if you know what I mean. Markets love stability, I still, man. I still feel like it's nothing compared to what it's going to be. We're so young and nascent, and like the, the the adoption that's to come based on the things we'd like to do once we once you actually can handle scale mm-hmm. will reflect drastic changes in the price. And we're just still playing around with it as a bunch of nerds in an experiment, right? Like we have, there's businesses that use it. There's, you know, use cases associated with it. We have a, a blockchain that's secure and it can kind of keep data time stamped that can't be changed. There's a lot of use like things around that. But in the, the day, the amount of people using it is still small relative to where we would like to be. <laughs> In kind of th- what we all see, foresee this happening, like we're talking, we always talk about this as the new, t- the new exponential technology of taking over the world and becoming like everyday part of it, like a everyday part of everyone's lives. If that's the case, the price of a Bitcoin is going to skyrocket, or Ethereum, mm-hmm. or whatever blockchain be- fills that niche. And talking the, about differences between eight hundred and twelve hundred dollars is nothing. It's like yeah, whatever, sure. Short-term speculation. Going to the moon. But, you know, like, if nothing ever happens, then we're going to stay around this area. But assuming we can get past these issues that we're currently having and keep developing the network and pushing it forward, then the prices just will continue to grow. If people keep using it, the amount of Bitcoin that's in in circulation gets smaller it gets larger but the rate at which it comes into play gets smaller and smaller and smaller so as time goes on you have a more scarce resource with more people trying to get at that resource very much like the gold boom and Mm -hmm. and that means the price goes up and that's just that's just simple supply and demand when you add on new potential use cases and all the other stuff that we're not even aware of yet based on what we can do with this technology, then you have increased demand. The price goes up. I don't, it's just, mm-hmm. I think but the discussing the stability demand. of where we are right now is stupid. The thing about supply and demand though, Corey, is that how many, how many high school seniors do you know that elected to take economics their senior year? So, I was one of probably like 10. We were forced to take it. You were forced to take econ? Yeah. That's uh, part of our, part so of our high school We weren't forced curriculum. to take it. Were we forced to take it, Cello? Did uh, you take econ? I wasn't an AP. I was in just the core stuff. I wasn't an AP. Uh, I, was. I didn't have to take it. I was. I was halfway in AP. Straight AP, AP, son. That humanities AP just made me just want to punch not, baby. Yeah, no. not try. <laughs> Catterbury Tales or whatever it was. No thanks. Dress up, dress <laughs> up like a Viking day. Yeah. I was yeah. like, what? Canterbury. This is stupid. Anyway, what was it? Um, Cat, is it Canterbury? Cat, Cat, Canterbury. Yeah. No thanks. Um, um, what was so I going to say with that? So my my whole point of saying that was is that not a lot of people even took econ. So, so simple supply and demand isn't something that like is wide as widespread knowledge as you think it would be. Yeah, but that's not what I'm saying. Like it's it it it, it is regardless of whether or not people know it, it is a simple supply and demand, right? It the more yeah. demand inc- increases, we know what the supply is of bitcoin. Well, actually it's a bit mm-hmm. more complicated than what you think. So, let's actually talk about that for a moment. So, 
<clears throat> every block uh-huh. we have 12.5 Bitcoin coming into circulation. Over time, around every four years or so, this gets halved. And so the circulation or the new supply of brand new newly minted Bitcoin that's available for use decreases over time. So over time, there would just essentially be no more new Bitcoin with a maximum of 21 million Bitcoin. But when you think about it in terms of what's actually useful or what's used in supply, it's much, much less than 21 million. So you have all of the Bitcoin that was lost in the early days from the experiment. A lot of people like old hard drives from the machines that people threw away because when back when it was worth nothing, people didn't hold on to their private keys. People experimented, burn the keys. So there's a good percentage, like all, all Satoshi's Bitcoin, mm-hmm. that's all essentially not in supply. You can't buy that. You can't use it. You also have a significant amount of just holders, people who have bought Bitcoin early or now, and they just hold it and don't use it. That's no longer part of the supply of Bitcoin. And mm-hmm. as long as Bitcoin remains a speculative vehicle for the far future, there's going to be a good percentage of Bitcoin not in circulation because people are holding it. And so what's left is what people are actually using, buying and selling for goods and services, which is a very mm-hmm. small, a much smaller percentage than the possible 21 million. And so that's your supply. And as the use cases grow for Bitcoin, the demand grows with it. And so you have a much, much higher pressure for demand than people willing to release their Bitcoin supply, which means the price has to grow because there's more of a demand for it. So people are willing to pay more for it. And that's that's the only that's the only price mechanism we have for what a Bitcoin's worth is what's willing what someone else is willing to pay for it. Mm-hmm. So there's your basic econ 101 what the hell supply and demand is. And some basic math 101. There will never actually be 21 million Bitcoin. Well, there will be like yeah. 19,000, 19,999,999. Well, there's, there's a, a website that will show you prove, like provably burned Bitcoin. So the Bitcoin that has essentially just been provably burned and gone so that we know it's less, it's, it's no longer in existence and can never be used. Like there's a, still a percentage of a chance that Satoshi moves the original Bitcoin money that he has. And the, you know, all the Bitcoin from the early days it's moved by some magical reason. There's a percentage of a chance that that happens, but yeah, I'm in say 20 million, not 19 yeah. million. <laughs> That's my bad. Um, I get what you're saying. So the supply is, so when we say the supply is predictable, we shouldn't say the supply, we need to qualify it. We should say like we've qualified in the past, the, the, uh, let's say the input of new supply is predictable. Inflation rate. The inflation rate is predictable. Yeah, it's 100% predictable. That's what it is. In the, in the far go. future. We, we know exactly how much money the supply like of new Bitcoin is from here on out. What the supply will be in terms of what's in circulation for use, a little more difficult to judge. But we know the maximum of what that can be. What do you guys think about that public service announcement that they posted yesterday? Who's they? Bitcoin.com. I don't really read Bitcoin.com. What did it say? Oh, you're talking about where they were like, there's extreme propaganda going on right now. And uh, right now there's a group of valiant Voltron lions trying to defend the universe. No, well, that's, what I, that's what I read too. Yeah, that's and exactly what I read. <laughs> they have formed Voltron to eliminate the imperial scum that is the rest of the motherfucking Bitcoin community <laughs> that all wants to segment. Yeah. And we should join the valiant efforts of the black, green, blue, red, and orange lions as they form. <laughs> yeah, I read that stupid ass PSA. Yeah, doesn't that stuff just like hurt Bitcoin? It's so stupid. 
it only hurts Bitcoin because to us because we're involved and we care. But like it, I tell you, like someone with a monicum of interest who's thinking about putting their money into Bitcoin because that's usually how people get into Bitcoin. They look at that stuff and they're like, ah, oh, that's weird. Let me go get some other resources. Like they don't care that much. We care that much because we've been in it so long and we've seen this drama de- envelop since three years ago when Gavin was like, hey, guys, I think we're going to hit the block, the block cap or the block uh, size limit soon. Like, that's pretty much what started all of this. And then now we've got to the point now where we've seen this uh, Hispanic soap opera on Telemundo play out. Hmm. But anybody who's new, who comes into the scene, like tomorrow, they, they're not going to care. They just they either want to know, A, how much is the price and where can I get some? Or B, what's this technology all about? When they read something like that, they're going to go, huh, weird. Exactly. That's about it. I did read that PSA, though, to answer your question. Corey, did you read that thing? No. Do you want to? No. (laughs) I I, I feel like not giving Roger Ver any real, like, playtime in my head. You've got to stay objective, Corey. Remember, we've got that one listener out there. That was like he's like no I am I don't I don't I don't respect his <laughs> opinion very much right now. That's like that's he just, he I'm, I, I can have an opinion. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. I'm not stating science or fact. It's like I don't I don't know I don't I don't I would prefer not, not to follow what he says. I doesn't mean I don't believe anything that he says is true, but I don't want to hear it from him. I'd rather hear it from someone who has facts and is a scientist and. Does the development know, not just pays for it? I don't want to hear it from anybody, regardless of which, <laughs> ar- <laughs> regardless of which argument is right. It's it's drifted so far from any like semblance of a cohesive community that we once had, and like these PSAs and these pop ups, it's 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 going to be hard to come back from from sentiment that's dropped to this level. I think this is like the final blow. It's, no, it's, it's a community, and the, as the community grows, you're gonna find you're gonna find factions, right? It's it's the way humans work. Period, especially yeah, when man. money's involved. The but bigger it's just something two, gets, it's just two though, two different ways to upgrade Bitcoin, so it scales better. No, That's just, it. There's actually quite a few different ways. The the, the larger two are mm-hmm. one that's been tested, and there's one that hasn't small... been tested. Yeah. There's a small group of people out there that are like, we want eight megabyte blocks, and that's what we vote for. I mean, you got like, extension there's, there's blocks, a, the purse. They recently came out with yeah, extension, extension blocks, blocks, which is a, like, which is a, which is a essentially a modification of a scaling proposal from a long time ago that has a lot of really good ways of working and has become really, in my opinion, probably one of the better non political ways of moving forward. Actually, the latest Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast, um, I think it's the latest one. Andreas does a really good job of describing the differences amongst the most popular and probable proposals for scaling. As well as you know like, the gonna... political versus technical v- validity of them. I'm going to stick to my story. I think that Bitcoin's not going to scale until it needs to scale. This is what I see. Here's a future. Follow me down this uh, yellow brick road. Actually, burgundy brick road. I'm going to call it burgundy. Bitcoin's not going to scale until it needs to scale. So something is going to cause a massive influx of transactions, which is also going to call a cost, like it's going to cause an exponential increase in fees, where fees get so large, like, just ridiculously large. Like you want to send one dollar, it's gonna cost you one thousand dollars to send the one dollar, and then that's when the miners start losing because they're like, "Whoa, wait a second! Nobody's gonna pay a thousand dollars to send one dollar. Nobody's gonna pay one Bitcoin to to send point zero zero five Bitcoin. These fees are stupid. The system is broken, and then when the system breaks, Bitcoin is." fucked and all the transactions leave like people are like oh the system's way broken it's stupid it's not free they said it was almost free it's not free anymore so they're gonna leave bitcoin and then so bitcoin loses its value and then people are gonna jump onto another coin i think you live in a fantasy but world like it's never gonna i get don't to live that. in a fantasy world you like, like people aren't gonna use was, the system 
people are going to create use cases that do things that increase the increase the fee structure unless they have a Wait reason a to like you can't grow to that type of fee mark the fee market until unless people are actively using the network and paying those I fees. Just like Wait, pause. Wait, I'd like to point out that I built the whole start of that by saying it's follow me down the yellow brick road, which is a fantasy world. And you, <laughs> you pointed out you live in a fantasy world. Yes, I was building a fantasy world for people to go to. <laughs> you live in a fantasy world. Well, like real worlds don't have yellow brick roads, Corey, or burgundy yeah, well, ones. That's not what's going to happen. It's, How do you know you, that? You don't know that. Because people won't pay it. Like the, the the higher the fee goes, the more you price out certain use cases of using the blockchain, of the Bitcoin blockchain, right? For that right now, we have an average fee of a, I think a dollar. Well, guess what? You're not sending a dollar on Bitcoin because it costs a dollar to do it. So, like as you raise the saying. fee, I'm just then you're like losing Bitcoin. the use cases. And so, if we get to a thousand dollars, people are still using the Bitcoin blockchain for things that are drastically larger than a thousand dollars. And they're using it a lot. I think so, the system has to break down has, a little that's, bit that's, that's before a it can be built out. I think the system has to break down a little bit before it can be built out. It's oh, not going to scale. until It needs to scale. I feel like that's there's going to be a price drop um, before we go any higher than what we currently are at, because there's going to be something that happens that loses a lot of confidence and trust in the system before we mm -hmm. remain steady and then do something about it. Like, like, like you just said, something needs to happen. And then we remain steady, move forward and are able to scale further on than what we are now. But there's going to be, I feel like there's going to be something that happens to initiate like a loss of confidence in the system. If not, if not already now with this, this scaling of it. Well, technology historically scales, whether it's uh, phone lines or computer chips. It's yeah, scale. Sure. I mean, yeah, figuring that mean scaling out. Bitcoin has to be is, that technology. Figuring that scaling out is not something that happens until it absolutely needs to happen. It's not, it, it never has been and never will be. Like, okay, here, let's fast forward the clock on a totally different subject. We got our boy Elon, right? Our boy Elon is launching these missiles that can land and go back up, right? He wants to make space travel hella cheap. Well, let's say we do accomplish that Star Trek-ass world where space travel is hella cheap. How are we going to scale that out? How are we going to have, like, rockets in the middle of the Midwest? Like, you keep, like who, nobody's going to figure out that problem until they need to. No, it's going to be like that Matt Damon movie. Not everyone gets to go to the moon, only, like, you know. Oh, it's going to be like Elysium? Elysium. I think that's Elysium the way it is, is going to be. In, is it, doesn't Elysium mean heaven in like mythology world? That's what that makes sense. I thought that's where the gods lived, right? Or something. Some 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 mythology. I feel like I'm right there. Yeah, I feel like that's that's probably how it's gonna go. You think so? How do I get on Elysium then? I'm probably gonna have to smoke on myself in. Yeah. What? <laughs> Short answer. I got it right here. I got it right here. Conception of the afterlife that developed over time and was maintained by some Greek religious philosophical sects and cults. Bam! Your boy read. Your boy is well read. I'm well read. I didn't know that one. I just thought it was a cool word for the movie. Now it makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> now it makes sense. That's what right. happened. One please yeah. for Elysium. That sounds cool. That's a cool word. I'm gonna enjoy this movie. It's a cool word. That's a cool word. Uh, let's let's <laughs> cool word on over to our interview. Okay. All right. <laughs> Cello, hit us with an intro. I don't have an intro because Corey did this one. Oh, oh great. Wait. Yeah, so Thank I can do this. Uh, Cynthia Gaten is our is our interviewee this time. She is someone I met um, doing local meetups in the D.C. area. Um, she's done a few talks on um, like IP patent law and its kind of implications in the blockchain world and how to start thinking about these things and how to protect the things that you build um, in the, the traditional regulation in the traditional law industry. She's a lawyer. She teaches and she's heavily invested <laughs> into like a lot of like what this technology does, where it's headed, 
so on and so forth. So I, I want to invite her on and get her opinions on just various things, have a chat with her. So yeah. Here, did I interrupt you? Nope. Here it is. Hey everybody. Today I'm joined with Cynthia Gayton. And uh, why don't you give give, give uh, our audience a little introduction as to who you are and um, how you got into the space. Okay. I am an attorney by training. I represent small businesses, software developers, anyone who's an innovator, primarily. I also teach engineers at uh, the University of Maryland and George Washington University. I've been doing that for GW for about 10 years. And this is the first semester I've taught undergraduate students at uh, University of Maryland. It's a little unusual since I am not teaching lawyers, which was by design. I wanted to teach engineers, people who make things. Um, I graduated from George Mason University Law School and undergrad at George Washington University. Interested in Bitcoin for a number of years, but it really started to become present to me. I had owned a uh, steampunk art gallery for almost four years. And uh, there's an annual event, Steampunk World's Fair in Piscataway, New Jersey. And I saw that people were were selling their products and Bitcoin was being used. And so it made it real. Uh, Bitcoin at that, prior to that was a concept. And uh, so it was just kind of cool to, to see that it was about 2012, 2013. So that's how I learned about Bitcoin. Because it was a practical, as a as a merchant, any way that I could uh, save some money in, in terms of transactions was of interest to me. And then the other elements with regard to, you know, reducing transaction costs. And then blockchain became an interest to me because I was updating my textbook and I became interested in smart contracts. So there was lots of intellectual interest to me in this field as well as the practical application. I definitely see coming from your lens. I mean, you spend a lot of time trying to teach people how to protect the things that they create or the ramifications of going about, I guess, the with public interfacing to those things that they create. And with kind of this developer centric community that we've built around Bitcoin, Ethereum, blockchain, it's, there's a lot of people creating things and not a lot of information on how they're going to protect it. And since it's so new, there's not a lot of, I guess, legal ramifications as to how we treat these things. Like how, how do you, how do you go forth in a world like this? I think you always have to think about a synthesis. There's in terms of, what is actually new? You know, the the idea of protecting intellectual property is is not new. It, this is just a new way of of thinking about it. The um, possibilities are really open with regard to intellectual property and and blockchain technology, and then Bitcoin as a way of moving it around in terms of your finances. Uh, so there's a lot of there are a lot of possibilities. The legal issues will be as they always are. You know, while smart contracts, there's a certainly a, there's a contractual element to it, but it's not the kind of contract people think it is. There's kind of a two level of contracts where the transaction itself, where there's communication. Um, transmitted where there's a whole other level of contractual responsibility that's that's what's interesting to me is how is that reflected and the accuracy of the human contract what people think the terms are that they're entering into i think that's very confusing i don't think i i don't think people understand the transactions that they're entering into when they're using blockchain <laughs> that's my yeah, I definitely would agree with that, especially because it's like a lot of people can't read code. And so they don't like to take, for instance, the DAO, right? Like the, mm-hmm. the, the code 
that was implemented. The contract that was put into the blockchain had a, you know, was designed in such a way that you could do this reentrancy bug. Uh, but I mean, that's that's what that's what the code said. And those that put right. money into it essentially signed a, you know, at least a social contract that said they, you know, agree to the terms that of the of the, that this code or this contract runs. The code of this contract runs, and whatever happens is, you know, what we've put our money into. And then when that, you know, unforeseen circumstance happened where everyone stole from it based on a bug in the code, they're like, well, this isn't what I expected. Well, it's been there the whole right. time. And you, like, that's the part. You can't change it once it's submitted. And like that that's kind of a, a weird question that I have is, say someone puts a smart contract on the Ethereum network. It has certain amount of functionality, whether it's, you know, implied or not. Who's culpable responsible for the contents of that contract and the people that use it is it the person who submits it is it the people who use the contract like it it seems as though when you're trying to find the blame game when something's go wrong when something goes wrong it's much more difficult nowadays if not impossible well it's one of the certainly with software you know in a in regular world uh you have liability restrictions you will put into the the terms and conditions related to your software that you're not going to be liable for certain things. And one of them is you take the code as is. That's the general, that's the general mm -hmm. disclaimer. Because if, if you're, if you don't have any opportunity to modify, if you don't have any, you know, to modify the terms with regard to the performance, if you don't have any input and you're taking it as is, which I understand is really what everybody agreed to was that, the code is as is, and if you don't understand it, it's incumbent upon you to investigate. Um, so from a traditional software contract scenario, the liability would usually be built into the, to the terms and conditions related to the transaction. Um, so when I look on websites, that's one of the first things I became a little obsessed with looking at terms and conditions of websites with regard to what when you agree to go on the website, when you agree to a transaction using eBay, when you do all those things, nobody reads the terms and conditions. All they know is they want to buy the thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I'm particularly concerned about because there is a lot of money involved here. It's not a, you know, a $10 transaction on eBay perhaps, or, um, you know, so an eBay also sets up its own, uh, refund policy and things like that. There's things that are in place, but it took time. Anyone who knows, you know, the history of eBay understands that there was, there were all kinds of elements of fraud. There was uh, fake products being sold, all those kinds of things. And it took time for it to build trust. Um, but, at, but at the same time, if people don't want to uh, educate themselves about these kinds of things, then it's a, it's a buyer beware. It's very, in some respect, very old school. It's, it's law at the beginning of law in the sense that uh, until people bother to put some restrictions, um, it is a buyer beware. And it's similar with, with stock purchases. It can't guarantee results. There's all uh, kinds of things we, we experience outside of the Bitcoin blockchain environment that we're familiar with that, that can be applied here. So what are people screwing up? Like, I mean, like it's, we've, <laughs> we've gone back to almost the wild west, but in a digital era of dealing with people and, and, and the claims that they make in kind of this buyer beware aspect of it. And then sooner or later, we'll probably build more and more, you know, safeguards for people to not get screwed, not get screwed over, but they don't exist right now. Like what, what are people not getting? What are they screwing up? What are like the best practices that they might be able to do now? Is it just knowing that they should live with a buyer beware mentality? I think right now they they probably should. Uh, they should enter into this as a buyer beware mentality, just like you'd enter into a stock purchase, in my view. That's how I look at it, is if, you're, if you can't afford the risk, then you probably shouldn't do it. <laughs> um, you know, and if you want to dabble with it, like, you know, my my first stock purchase was McDonald's, <laughs> and I, and um, 
and I read cover to cover the annual report and I looked, you know, I knew the product I had, you know, I did a lot of investigation into that. And then reading the, we can't guarantee that you'll ever get your money back. Yeah. And, I, and I've made some bad uh, investments. Um, but having that disclosure was important to somebody novice like me um, to at least work through the, the elements, the things that I didn't know. But that's kind of the beauty of this, for me anyway, is this is a whole new way of looking at things and and adds a complexity and a, a level of anonymity that doesn't exist in other kinds of transactions. So it's it's cool from that perspective, but for me, it's a learning opportunity. And I'm not sure everybody else wants, <laughs> wants to look at it that way. I'm, it might be unusual. No, I feel like a good portion, a vast majority of the people in this space are definitely here because they want to learn. It's it's fascinating, right? Like one of the most common phrases used in this entire space is that I fell down the rabbit hole, right? When they talk about when yeah. they got introduced to Bitcoin and blockchain and Ethereum, they're just like, well, I heard about it and I sh you know, shunned it. And then I read a little bit and then bam, fell down the rabbit hole. It's because it's incredibly fascinating from almost any perspective, like whatever background you come from it's still fascinating and it's, but I, it's, it's one of those things where I, I get people excited about the technology and then immediately throw the disclaimer on there. Like, you know, if you're going to invest in this, make sure it's, it's play around money or you understand that, you know, all of this, we don't know what the hell's going to happen. And people generally are willing to take, take those risks as long as they're informed. I, I do find that to be, you know, to be true. And they, when you're talking about, you can find something to be interested in, in this space. The other part of this was the history of money. Generally, you know, what is it, what does it mean to even, what is money? Uh, then the idea of money in the United States and looking at the federal reserve and you look at time periods when we had each state had its own currency, you know, these, it was not that long ago um, in the history of the United States, that the Federal Reserve was not a done deal, that the you know, United States Bank was put on hold and it was only created to pay off debt for the revolution. And when you put it in context of, in some ways, Bitcoin is a return to the beginning of this country and is the beginning of many countries, not just the United States, but there's a rich history in monetary policy and the idea that the government shouldn't control, there should not be a central bank. There are many people who still believe that. Um, and it does cause a lot of, in many ways, causes harm. Well, on the flip side of that, there's a lot of things that, I guess, additional banking infrastructure has made convenient for the American people right. that I'm not terribly sure they're willing to give up. And that's, that's the truth of the matter is, are people going to read terms and conditions? Probably not. Yeah. <laughs> um, but all you can do is give them a you know button on the screen that says you agree because they're not going to, the likelihood of go them going through the effort. Um, but at least from a, you know, generally from a legal perspective, if you give them, op them an opportunity to review what could go wrong and they ignore it, then it's then the, the assumption is once the opportunity has been given and if, it un you know, there's certain kinds of things that can't be hidden, it has to be obvious on the screen and all that sort of thing, then, you know, you, you take the risk on your, on your own. There's, so I'm not that, right. yeah. Continue? No, I'm just my my point with that is that if if you're going to engage in this kind of thing, it is incumbent upon you to to learn about it. I would definitely agree, and I feel like I mean I I do my due diligence whenever investing in something or discussing something or maybe trying to teach somebody about something else. I want to make sure that I know like what I say is is true backed by facts. I'm a scientist. That's kind of how I work. Or if I don't, if I'm ignorant of something, I'd let the person that I know that I'm talking to that I'm ignorant. And yeah, like, because I'd say 
there are so many engineers and programmers in the space. That's that's a kind of an undertone of how people work. But as this grows, that's not always going to be the case. And the sh the shysters will come out of the out of the woodwork, and it's 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 really hard to start picking out what's worth your while and what isn't in this space. Like, I, I'm not where I don't know where I'm going with this. I'm just kind of talking. Uh, well, there, well, there's some, you know, there's a, there's a, a beauty in having people who are speaking the same language working on a project. That's the other thing this reminds me of. It reminds me of, you know, the pre dot com bust, where mm. people were working on projects and that element of cooperation and the enthusiasm, it was infectious. I mean, it was that's when I first started my practice. Um, there was there's so much energy, a lot of excitement, and it was amazing to be part of those things. But the minute you started digging deeper into some of these <laughs> schemes, as, as you mentioned, you realize they have no idea. They don't, they're just appealing to, at the time, venture capitalists and retirement funds who had no idea what it was. All they knew it was cool. That's, that's all they knew. And they wanted to be part of it. Um, so I don't want that experience again because that was horrifying. I mean, it was a it was a very uh, bad time, especially when there's so many night really great bubbling um, small businesses certainly around here that uh, weren't able to survive that. Um, so that's the other my interest in this too is like how can I be ahead of something? Um, to prevent that sort of loss, you know, to, to have the diligence and have the, the research to back things up. Um, and I'm particularly interested in, in the arts on this side too, is because I, around that time was MP3, you know, and these all, there were, there were lots of overlap with the dot com and, and the music industry. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the programmers knew what they were doing. Musicians had no idea. They just thought, oh, I can put my music on mp3.com. You know, I can, this is how I'm going to promote my music. Meanwhile, having no idea where their music was going, <laughs> <laughs> what was being and done it's with gone. it. <laughs> and it's gone. And there's entire industries built on the, on the, on the free nature of mp3 files. And uh, that's like a personal goal of mine is to avoid that uh, in in the future because I think this this particular technology is going to be even harder to figure out if you're not a programmer or it, you know you're not be, you don't have an the foundation yeah. of it like the way that it's built the infrastructure is being laid is not it's it's a value transfer system it's not a a, a freely infra like it's not free sharing of information like the internet was mm -hmm. built. It's right. it's digital value transfer, which mm -hmm. when you're dealing with electronic digital goods and assigning ownership to those digital goods as part of the infrastructure, then you have like it it allows the user to not care have to care as much. So we can build these user friendly systems eventually that allow for certain functionality that just works the way it should and protects the user the way it should, assuming we build them morally, and also pays them in a in an automatic way where you don't need the middlemen. And I think that's what kind right. of like touching on the tone of what excites you about all this is that us engineers, us programmers, us scientists, us people that care about that kind of stuff have the capability of building systems that that work the way they should without having to bear the responsibility of the user's data that use the system we build, if that makes any sense. Well, and, and so it, it does in some respects. I, I go to events on occasion and I look at some app developers and they're developing on many levels stalkerware, you know, stalker apps where the design is about where finding people. 
So while there is a altruistic and sometimes a uh, a feeling that what people are developing is a good thing, the good might be just good for the person who's developing and not necessarily for society. So I, I am concerned about the the ethical component um, because it's it is striking um, how it's not part of an everyday discussion. And that's something I, every one of my classes has an ethics component um, because we're all members of society. And as engineers, as attorneys, we all have these responsibilities, not necessarily do we abide all of them, by all of them as we should, but um, being aware of what the effect of what it is that you do could have on other people is a important component of in my mind at any at any education. So isn't that kind of the beauty of I guess what this technology tries to do is it puts a lot of the responsibility of personal information or things that could be taken advantage of into the hands of the of the user and not into the hands of the business that the user interfaces with. So one, the business or, or, or program or software that gets put onto the system doesn't have to hold the responsibility of their user's data. And that responsibility gets put back in the hands of the people that kind of own that information or like or the, the, the whole di digital identity play. Like you manage your own money now. You have control over your own money. And when you give it up, you're a lot more intuitively aware of giving up that responsibility with a system like this. Whereas in the past, that wasn't even possible. Yeah, that 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 was another element I was interested in. Was uh, I had written a, a couple of years ago about things like Facebook and the social media that basically you're the you're the product, and there people are making money again off of your your person, you know the things that interest you, and but there's no recourse with the misuse of that information really, because you have to show if in a, in the system that we have, you'd have to show damages somehow that you've been harmed. You lost your job, you lost money, all those kinds of things. And otherwise you have no cause of action. Um, so I thought, well, if there, if you did have a property interest in your own identity, then you could sue because that would be a property damage, right? Hmm. <laughs> So it would be easier to make a claim for the property elements of yourself. Now, there are a lot of people who say, well, how can I, I don't want to be property. I don't want to consider myself that way. Well, that's mm -hmm. how you're being treated. So why not take advantage in some way of, of those elements of your person um, and find a way to, to leverage that to your advantage. And then, but then on the other hand, there's, the bad side of that is is trying to create more things about your person that are marketable, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it wouldn't be it wouldn't be enough just to be yourself. It'd be you'd have to be even more intriguing for somebody to want to buy more information about you. And that worries me too. Is do I would I really want to support something that you're creating a market about yourself and then you're just not that interesting? <laughs> or nobody's really interested in your what it is you want to sell. I mean, it would create a whole <laughs> That's other. It's both depressing other... and in invigorating at the same time. <laughs> so there's always, you know, that's there's always good and bad with these things, and I I like to concentrate more on the good. But I like to be aware of where things, you know, can can go wrong. Is that the eventual tagline of blockchain? It's like blockchain, sell yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, I was thinking about that this morning. I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be asked, but, um, but as I am preparing, you know, dealing with my taxes and I'm looking at the interest rates I've been paying on things and I realize that you, when you look at how much of your life is paying debt, your, the, the money that you're earning is paying debt. Um, so is this a way of diversifying the mortgage on my life? 
if I could reduce the amount of the mortgage on my life yeah. <laughs> in terms of, of having enter, entering into agreements that cost less, then I have more of my life, right? <laughs> so if this is a way to reduce that debt that I owe and, and enter into transactions that can do that, then it's good for me. Hmm. Me thinking of that completely lost my train of thought <laughs> what I was going to ask next, because that's a very interesting way, like, way of putting it. And you have a, it's, it's also an easier way of, like, that, of crowdsourcing, if you will. You can crowdsource the, the debt of your life uh, a little easier with closer to your community because this, this technology allows you to build communities across the world um, in a digital way that they're exactly like the type of people that you would like to interact with. And then you can right. transfer funds amongst that community and, you know, build DAOs and all kinds of other things that will eventually be a part of our future. And that, like how we interact socially based on this technology is something that I, I really look forward to. And then how we then share value within the micro communities that we create based on the things we like doing are going to be like insane. Like just for, take for instance, the art community or the steampunk art community is going to be an easily accessible community for you that you can transfer value in and communicate with like in a much, in a much better way. And that's the other element of this that I'm interested in is the, is the global nature. If, for example, if I, you know, I listen to internet radio from all over the world and I'll listen to some music or I'll hear about a book and I can't buy it because it's in another country and it's not released, has not been approved for release in the United States. So that's, a, and that's a copyright restriction usually that the copyright, that they wouldn't be able to sell the book uh, into the United States because it would be a licensing violation. These are the kinds of things I want to get around. That shouldn't be how it is. If I want to buy somebody's music in Denmark, and because I heard their music, I should be able to do that. Because if I heard it, I should be able to buy it. So if if these are ways to break down some of these types of laws, I, I mean, I don't... I have I have no intention of infringing on it, especially the fact that I'm willing to buy it. I have no intention of infringing mm -hmm. on their rights. Um, but if this could ease those kinds of transactions, I mean, I there are so many things that I'd like to buy from around the world that um, if this could ease that, make it a little bit easier, break down those barriers. That talk about a, an economy boom. Um, there'd be so many opportunities to, to trade. And that's why I'm like, we need to, you know, where we are right now uh, in the United States is kind of a little putting a crimp in my style because I was getting so excited <laughs> about, about what Bitcoin and blockchain was going to do. I was like, oh God, this is going to, this is going to be the, the opportunity to really take advantage of a global market. We were on our way there. Well, that's a weird, um, it's a weird aspect of that is, is how regulation plays a role. Because currently, right now, it seems as though the regulators who would like to keep track of where people are spending their money and the inflow and outflow of money from the country are just fitting cryptocurrency and they're attempting to fit cryptocurrency into the ex existing regulation without creating something new. And cryptocurrency is an abstraction of money. And right. By definition, it can't fit into something that's abstracting. Like it's it's a generalized right. value transfer. And when you try and pigeonhole that into a regulation that deals with maybe you know a, a, a commodity and only that, then you're really limiting the use cases that you can legally use it for. I guess quote unquote legally, right? I, I'm I'm curious as to yeah. you know, like how like what what could the regulators possibly do other than just say we don't know which is never going to happen because they want like uncle sam's gonna get his money right and this is where it's 
you know, kind of a little bit unfortunate because the idea of barter, um, it is recognized in the tax code that if if you I think talking about this, but um, if I want to give you five apples for three oranges, that is allowed. It would be income to me and be income to you for those two tra that transaction, and it would have to be reported. So that kind of thing is regulated only in, in the sense that it's you'd have to report your income related to those things. Um, and that's where I see that this is kind of failing to um, – can it be considered a, a an exchange versus currency? And and I don't know what the because I you know I'd rather it be considered an exchange that I've I've determined the value of Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency to be X and that I'm willing to give that this other thing that I think is the equivalent of that. Um, for example, the you know in an eBay model, just because I'm willing to pay twenty five dollars for an old newspaper, doesn't mean that that's the actual value. That's what I'm willing to pay. <laughs> Yeah. So, so do I have to re if does that person have to report that money that they've received? Sure. You know, I don't I don't have any problem reporting um exchanges. Now when that's the situation, obviously you're not dealing with you know, I'm not giving somebody somebody's not giving me their old newspaper for my old books. Um <laughs> but it is but that happens. Uh it, yeah. to, to circle back around, uh like People aren't going to do this. Like they're not even going to read user license agreements. And as the number of tokens yeah. grows and grows and grows, and keeping track of these tokens rel relative to each other and exchanges you make on a daily basis, maybe even if the systems are exchanging tokens on the back end and you're not aware of it, you can't report this stuff. Like you can't keep track of all of these things. Right. If I reported every buy and sell of Bitcoin that I have, my taxes would be just ridiculously long and there's services that do that that make ridiculously long tax statements for you <laughs> and that's just one cryptocurrency and as you start to exchange across all of them it it's it's almost untrackable so if it's untrackable it becomes intractable to report them and i don't understand how if our model for exchanging value with other humans moves slowly into only being this, what regulatory bodies are going to do if they can even survive to keep up? Would it be possible, and this is, could you bundle these transactions into categories? Potentially. I don't know. That's a potential. Um, it, I mean, it definitely depends on the use case of the token you're trading, right? Right. And all of these tokens that are use useful, the, 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 the good tokens in all of these networks actually have a use. It's not just pure speculation. I would say the, the tokens that are purely speculative are the bad ones. It's the ones that have a use in the system of you know whatever problem they're trying to solve that are the good ones. And so when you, and that's that's kind of what makes it not money or not a commodity or kind of a right what way did i kind of i'd say the, the legal purposes of saying i'm not doing an ico but an i like an initial token offering or something like that is you need to have a use case of your token which puts you in better legal ground groundwork because if all you're doing is speculation then it all looks like money in a commodity and I, right. I i think you can bundle them based on what the hell you're using it for but in the end if you can trade a token that you know, wash you know you get for washing clothes, or a token that you or that your your neighbor has for creating reproducible light energy, in a, like a very barter like way, on a peer to peer basis. I mean that, that's a potential future of what this technology offers is like peer to peer bargaining, bartering based on you know a ridiculous coincidence of once scenario. So the part of the problem is too is that this if you did the exact same thing with cash right then the, all your cash transactions you aren't sitting around like you know if i pay cash for things i'm not tracking every single cash payment 
that I'm making. I'm just not doing it. Um, and then using that as if you're using your Bitcoin as cash, is that what you're using it as is in your example? Good way to put it. If you kind of have a base, a standard, if you will, of value. You can just if, evaluate everything you've done in your, in your into a single standard. Yeah, because apparently, and I, I read in the IRS's position on using Bitcoin for purchases as a different, you know, uh, qu quality than for investment. So purchasing, it's treated like regular income. If you, you know, used use Bitcoin to buy and then the merchant would have to report it as regular income because it has something to do with selling a good versus the person who's using it as an investment vehicle would that would have a different tax treatment. So bundling it bundling it as if it's cash, that might be a better better way of categorizing things, but then again that would require people to step back and look at their spending if you were, if this was ever going to happen, which I can't imagine. Um that each that as you make these transactions, they are identified as a thing, just like your bank statement with your ATM purchases. Each one of these things has a particular category. Is it is it groceries? Is it whatever? And then you'd only identify identify those things that are income as those things that are reportable. Um, I'm sure there's you know, there's a way of of doing that because the the example is cash. I think with that. Yeah. Bottom line, audience, <laughs> go read about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it, it can get really deep. I started thinking about Heidegger <laughs> with with regard to the nature of of money, because his part of his thinking outside of his, you know, sympathies <laughs> um, was understanding the layers of being of an of a thing or an entity and how would it how it exists on many different levels and our relationship with money is one of those things it 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 represents many different layers of things and our psyche is a as a representation of many many things and i think um, having an understanding of what is it that this is representing to you because that's part of the discussion that people are having about bitcoin and blockchain generally is what are these things representing um, is it an intellectual exercise? And I get a lot of that. Is it a, you know, uh, an anti-government exercise? Is it a, what is it that you're getting out of this uh, and participating in this? And there's some something for everyone, I, I think, uh, to have a discussion about. But I am curious about the, can people have and I'm certainly seeing this, people having the emotional attachment to to this. And is it to the Bitcoin or is it to the idea? Is it to, you know, and with blockchain, is it to the idea? Because I can definitely see the idea being very attractive and having some emotional response to, to that. Um, and I'm actually more frightened of people who don't have that, that they aren't... Um, is somehow or another invested in uh, in changing how things are. I think I'm a little more frightened of people who aren't interested in making a change. Hmm. I think that's a I think that's a, a fantastic kind of thought to end on. Um, I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, one more question: oh, yeah. that we, Of course, we ask everybody: Can you describe Bitcoin in ten words or less? Let's see my Bitcoin. It's a way of basically a resurrection of value and trading on a customer level. Um, that's what I I think of it as is a is a sort of, of resurrection of value. We're, Resurrection of value and trading on a customer level, I think, is seven yeah. words. Okay. Love that. <laughs> also, making you go incredibly succinct after going and in kind of this uh, like 
deep philosophical idea of what this technology is supposed to be doing and what it's doing to us uh was it was a nice a nice way to end this thanks for thanks for coming on oh thank you it's good talking to you and that was the interview with cynthia gates we hope you enjoyed it and we hope you all all have just signed up for law school because of it go to law school because the world is going to need future lawyers in the land of blockchain anyways real so they can represent blade remember there were lawyers in that movie they were were. vampires i do remember that i do remember that that was an interesting segue why did you come up with blade (laughs) <laughs> well, he said he said we're going to need lawyers in the future, and I feel like future lawyers represent vampires. And then I remember Blade. <laughs> you say that, that so that was, matter of fact. <laughs> that was the the initial <laughs> initial transition is like, well, of course, future lawyers are going to need to represent vampires. Everyone knows that. I mean, you make it sound ridiculous. <laughs> Everyone knows lawyers are going to represent vampires in the future. Step one, this is what we know. Vampires exist in the future. Step two, (laughs) lawyers are going to need to be representing these vampires. (laughs) Now that we know these things, we can move forward with other things. True blood was actually prophetic. That's what it is. Okay, so, Cello, there was something that you were going to tell us before the show. But you waited until after the interview to tell us. What was it? Um, is this about ads? Uh, this... Yeah. Well, you weren't supposed to say that. You were supposed to just do the ad. But uh, I was trying to think maybe there was something I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> was I? Is there is there something that I cared about? Was there something? Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to talk to you guys about the Equibit Development Corporation, short for EDC. Uh, This is a very big deal. It means a lot to us because they're building several apps that are decentralizing the securities industry. And the securities industry is a big deal because it's kind of like the banking industry. You know, it's filled with uh, centralized intermediaries that clear and sell transactions. You know, they they handle shareholder communications and other, you know, labor intensive work. And uh, these expensive tasks can now be replaced with peer to peer technologies that brings the cost of performing this work down dramatically. Uh, So, you know, issuing companies, dealers, investors, uh, they're all going to benefit significantly uh, from cutting away this part of their overhead. Uh, So if you want to learn more about this, uh, go to Equibit.org and sign up for their newsletter. And uh, their second uh, ICO uh, with new terms is uh, pending. So all the details are going to be leaked and you can find out more about all that awesome stuff. Yeah, I was uh, like. I've I've invested into this. I I read the white paper and I was really interested to like what the Equibit base token is and how it's used and um, how it corresponds to like interacting with Bitcoin. It's uh, pretty good stuff. I've talked to the guys. I'm I'm excited about them being successful. Bam. Yeah. So so we're gonna wrap this up. You know, uh, first of all, thank you guys for listening again. Uh, It's been another strong week in Bitcoin. Uh, And by strong, I mean Bitcoin still exists. (laughs) Because I feel like like every day Bitcoin exists is like at least a thousandth of a percent, edging it over the 50-50 that it is going to succeed or fail. And there is no science behind that. It's been 100% unceasing since its inception, right? It's it's been rocking hard since the the day it started. And mm-hmm. that, there's a lot to say about that. Talking like hair band rocking too, like fucking She's My Cherry Pie. Is that the name of that song? Like that She's queen. My Cherry Pie. Yeah. yeah. That's been Bitcoin since the beginning. So it's still going. Anyway. Uh, you, know, you know what else is still going? Escrow services. <laughs> what? Are you excited? What? what? We're brought to you by escrowbybits.com which is a merger of bitcoin and escrow services and it's the best program uh the best situation out there uh, all you gotta do is register and deposit your bitcoin seller will ship the item buyer checks the goods because you got to check the goods and then release your funds and uh, they also offer bitcoin escrow with a locked exchange rate so no matter where you are in the world they're going to take care of you uh they're going to charge a small flat escrow fee of one percent on all transactions but you can even 
uh, split the fee with the other party. So there's a lot of options. Uh, their goal is to make using escrow as simple as possible, and I think they nailed it. So uh, go to that website, sign up for that newsletter where you can escrow your shit with escrow my bits. Dot com. Boom. All right, let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. All right. First and foremost, I want to say shout out to Janice Ferguson, my sister, also known as Jen Fergie's in the Slack channel. <clears throat> um, she's gonna be a community manager, so she's gonna help, like, not help, but she's gonna like uh, be a community manager. Like, I wish I knew exactly what that did, but it sounded fancy. And she's gonna, <laughs> no, she's gonna help like engage everyone and and just kind of spark interesting conversation. And she's just gonna, it's gonna be awesome. If you if you don't know who she is and you'd like to, and you want to just get a taste of how awesome it is gonna be, go listen to the first episode of On Ramping with D. Um, so she is not only uh, so she's not what she'd call like the ideal community manager because she doesn't, she's not that versed in Bitcoin, which I think is awesome. So she's going to be able to be taught Bitcoin by you guys who are in the community as well as learn at the same time. And so it's going to be like, basically the whole reason that she wanted to join the Slack and come in there is so she, she could learn more about Bitcoin. And so she's going to be highly engaged with everyone. And, and so please welcome her if you see her name pop up in the Slack and her face. Um, so shout out to her. Shout out to Ken as well, who's rocking our snapbacks. That is a hat for those of you that aren't that hip. Um, <laughs> let's see. What else we got brewing? Uh, shout out to Moabs. Because up until this week, I thought the mother of all bombs was something from a video game I used to play called Command and Conquer Generals. But I found out in the middle of the week that we actually have those things, and they fuck shit up. So shout out to Moabs. You know what uh, we don't have, though? What's that? A Chrono Scepter. We need a Chrono Scepter so bad. Like, if you could just teleport our enemies through time, like, that, that'd that be the worst. They would hate it. Like, hey, North Korean guy, I'm going to teleport you back to... Uh, fourteen forty-five, and good luck. We just call it Kim Jong Un that for the rest of our lives. Just North Korean guy. Hey, North Korean guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they should refer to him on the news channels. North Korean guy threatened us again. What did he say this time? He's gonna uh, make all of our citizens. Board. A cerebral boar would be a great weapon. Any, any weapon from Turok needs to just be Turok, real. Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, taking it back. All right, Torok, get out of here. I gotta go. All right, shout out to Zoe Saldana. Shout out to Viola Davis. Shout out to Carrie Hilson as well. And here's a. I'm gonna throw a little curveball in there for you guys. Shout out to Charlize Theron. Oh, oh, oh! Hey, shout out to Eddie Murphy. He just lost a brother. And Happy Easter. Yeah, Happy Easter. Weird combination of things. (laughs) Anyways. Uh, play Corey. Do you you didn't give any shout outs? I don't know. Oh, we outs. gotta be like we gotta be like. I care for no one for the family. You care for no <laughs> one. Okay. Well, I'm gonna Im- imitate Corey and give a shout out. Uh, shout out to my uh, wife's company, Sweet Honey Crochet, where she crochets things uh, very masterfully on a daily basis. You can get crochet drinking gloves with Bitcoin um, patches on the back. If you request it. So shout out to Aaron, Corey's wife. <laughs> I would Play. never say Corey's wife. Maybe after. Play. Out.